I didn't really get approval testing when I first heard about it. I confess that I missed the point. That was certainly my mistake though. Approval tests are now an important part of my kit bag. I use them in specific circumstances though and would avoid their use in others. There are some uses for approval tests that I really don't like very much. So what is approval testing? How does it work and what's it best used for? And where should you avoid it? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. My preferred approach to testing is very test driven. I use tests to drive the development process throughout really, using acceptance tests to more clearly define the problem that I need to solve by creating them as executable specifications for the behavior of my system and fine-grained test-driven development to give me clear, fast feedback on the design of my code. I end up with good test coverage as a side effect of working like this and better design code and systems as a result. Before I go any further, let me thank our sponsors. We are fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis, Transfic, Roost and Sleuth. All these companies offer products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, click on the links in the description below to check them out. When I first encountered approval testing, I was in completely the wrong frame of mind. I was thinking about new code, and that is not, in my view, approval testing's real strength. This is partly a naming thing. Approval can be read as some kind of synonym for acceptance. And I think of acceptance testing as a way to specify new features. And I, make that, I made that mistake in my interpretation, I think. What approval tests are great at is confirming that you haven't changed anything, which isn't really what we want when we're changing things by adding new features. In this mode, though, of defending against change, approval tests are fantastic tools. Michael Feathers called approval tests used this way something else. He calls them characterization tests, which, are, if, if I'm honest, I think is probably a better name. The idea of approval tests is that you are starting with some legacy code, which Michael defines as code without tests, and you want to change it. You want to change it safely, of course. That is, you want the code to carry on doing the things that it does now, even though it's not structured in the way that you'd like it to be to help you make the changes that you want to make and to do those safely. So what approval or characterization tests really do is to allow us to refactor more safely. That's it, really. That's all it does. But for that job, it's extremely effective. What an approval test does is to record the result of some interaction with the system that you're working on. It stores the results in a file somewhere, and then the next time that you run the test, it compares the results that you just got from the code with the reference results that you stored in the file earlier. If anything changes in the results, the test fails. If the results are the same, the test passes. This is a great tool. You don't even need to understand the results. Let's take a little look. So here's my legacy system. It's not a very complicated legacy system, I'll grant you. Uh, this is just my hello world approval test. So uh, this code is going to do something not very complicated in actuality. We're just going to concatenate a string here. So we're going to pass in hello and we're going to concatenate world. And here is my test. This is also very simple. So we've included um, the library called approvals, which is an approval testing framework. And now I'm gonna do approvals verify. And that's it. We're just going to verify the results that I get back from my system, whatever those results might be. Now, what the framework's gonna do is it's gonna render those results into a form that it can store on disk. And the first time that we run it, this is the first time that we're running this, is that it's not going to work because we don't have, we haven't set up um, a condition for it to approve. So what it's saying is that the approved 
uh, and the receive doesn't match because they approved it just it, it, it just assumes that it's empty so it, it's generated these two files on the first run um, the name of my test and approved.txt and then the name of my test and received.txt so approved it didn't we haven't specified anything so it assumed that approval meant nothing and what it received was hello world in that in this instance that's the right answer so now what I can do is that I can rename this file so that that's approved so now it's saying that what we're expecting as a result in this test the approved result from this test is to say hello world so if I run this test again I get a pass so now I can refactor my code to my heart's content in full confidence that whatever changes I make, as long as they pass this test, my code's still doing what it's meant to do. Whatever the nature of the result from calling your system, the approval test framework will save it to a file and it will compare subsequent runs with the contents of this file. You can add different types of reporter to interpret and show a diff between the expected and actual results in the event of a failure. And you can add custom reporters to show results from your own system, if that makes sense in your use case. There are also often tools that help you deal with the results more simply. In my example, I changed the file names to more easily show you what was going on. But there's also some tooling to simply approve or reject a change following a failure that does the file manipulation for you behind the scenes. The basic principles of approval testing, though, are simple. The test asserts that the code is still doing what it did before. Now, there are some risks to this approach, which is where I originally got tripped up by approval testing. But there are times when this is extremely useful. Let's look at a slightly more realistic example than the previous one. So here is um, some more legacy code. Uh, uh, this is another legacy code standing, of course. This is just some bad code that I found on the internet. And it's pretty terrible. It's not quite as bad as a real legacy system, but it's bad enough for our purposes. Uh, there's a comment here which describes some aspects of the document that this thing is meant to parse. This is really fairly horrid code, uh, all told. So here's my test. And the starting point really for any kind of approval testing exercise in this context of refactoring a legacy document is to try and find the simplest place that you can start. What you want to be able to do is that you want to establish you know, a working uh, test uh, of the system and you want that to be simple as possible. So I'd start with something like this. In this case, I've identified the simplest possible document that I could think of. Um, and then the simplest possible XPath string, which is the, the forward slash, which is the start of the whole document. And then we're just going to verify that that works. Now, I've already run this test, so if I run it again, this should simply pass. And it does. We, we've got a passing test. So that's pretty good. Um, at this point, what I'm really interested in, so how good is this test? How much protection is this test giving me? So one way in which I can find that out is to look at the coverage of this test. So we could run this test once more, but this time monitoring the coverage, um, and um, we get a pass once more, and we can look at the coverage, and uh, in my IDE, it highlights the coverage like this, with this green bar is means that the test has ex exercised this piece of code, and a red bar means that it hasn't. So we got into the JSON thing, we managed to get a the, uh, the default root element of the document. We didn't manage to try finding an alternative st starting point. We got to look at the for statement, but it didn't execute because there weren't any elements inside that, that our starting point. So nothing inside that for loop has been tested. Uh, and then at the end, we got some stuff to just generate the string that represents the result. Um, there's another significant function, path mapping, here. And none of that is covered because that's, in, that's called from inside the for loop. So 
my test is passing and working, but it's not giving us a lot of protection yet. So now what we could do is that we could start thinking of adding to our test, mostly to our test data, to figure out how to get better coverage for our approval test. So now we're going to try and improve the complexity of the doc. I've got a slightly more complicated version of the document this time. Here it is, it's a little bit more involved, there's a little bit more data. And how I did that was that I went and looked at the comments in this file, and in particular, these comments gave me some clue. So basically, this is the simple version and I just cut this piece out of the comment and use that as test data to try and evaluate the stuff. So now we can run that test and confirm that that passes and it does. And now let's run it once again with coverage and see whether we've got a better uh, visibility into our code. So uh, once again, we've used the, um, the map that kind of has this stuff in. We've uh, got a little bit further. We didn't, do, we didn't do the alternative starting point, again, based on the XPath query, but we did get inside the loop this time. So we're inside the loop, we're evaluating things. There are bits of this that we're missing, um, but it's better. We, we've got better code coverage than we had before. Uh, how did we do? Yeah, we still didn't really talk into the path mapping function. Um, so better, but, but, but not, not all there yet. So we could try adding another test, adding a little bit more data uh, to, to our test, uh, filling out uh, the data and maybe changing the, the search string a little bit. And here we are, here's, here's, here's a, 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 another test. So this time we've got more complete data, I'll show you that. So uh, a little bit more complicated. So I, I took some more, I looked again at the comments in the, in, in the, uh, the code and pulled out a, bit, a few more examples. I was starting to understand a little bit more what the structure it was looking for was. And this looked like a better example of, um, uh, that would allow me to test a little bit more of the code. So now let's run that again and just confirm that that passes. And it does, and once more with coverage, so 89% line coverage now, 60% method coverage still. Um, let's have a look at the impact on our code. So we've got all parts of this, this part of the code covered. We're looking good inside of the for loop now. Uh, that's mostly covered. There's one exception here that we haven't covered. There's a case that we haven't covered. So we could think about adding one more test maybe. To, to extend our range for that. And here's another one uh, where we're looking for something about history of for a type of content that we haven't tested. So we could add a test for those things to, to evaluate those things. Did we cover the other method? Well, yeah, we got into here. Again, there's some stuff that we're just missing, some edge casey kind of changes, exception handling is not being tested and so on. So you could see how that would that, that could go. We could we could enhance our test just a little bit further. We could add some more tests just to increase our coverage all of the time to the point where we've got good coverage. At this stage, given what I know about the, where the changes are, I'd be reasonably happy to start with the level of coverage that I had uh, here for a real system, being cautious do it with my refactory. But this gives me a good place to start now changing my code. And as long as my, I could change my code in a way that it doesn't change those results, then I'm genuinely performing refactoring and um, this, this allows me to explore in much, in much more detail. I like this model of being able to combine um, the approval testing and the exploration of the approval testing and the exploration of the system um, using coverage to discover the bits that I need, the, that I need to enhance and that gives me good protection as I start down the road to refactoring my code. When working with legacy systems like this, I find that this combination of approval testing and coverage checking a simple, straightforward way to play with the inputs to get good enough test coverage to allow me to start refactoring with more confidence. Um, and it's also a valuable exploratory technique uh, for discovering more about the code that you're trying to work with. This is a good tool even when you don't know the code at all, but still need to start changing it. 
I mentioned earlier some of the risks that I see in approval testing. The problem here is that by definition, it's your code that defines a successful result. What if the code's wrong? In my first simplest test example, this is the saved correct result that the approval is based upon. It's a single closing square bracket with no opening bracket to partner it. This is almost certainly wrong, but it is what the crap legacy code does. This is a bug, and now that we're asserting that this bug is correct behavior for the system. However, when you're using approval testing to support refactoring like this, this is exactly what we want. If I'm refactoring a legacy system, I need to keep the bugs in place, at least while I'm doing the refactoring. It needs to be an active decision to fix them or not, because now you're changing the behavior of the system. In a real legacy system, it's often true that upstream or downstream systems know about some of the bugs that's in that system and may even depend upon them. So if you change things, even wrong things, you can sometimes break things in other places. Remember, refactoring is always about making behavior preserving changes. For new code though, this is not really what we want. And in approval testing, it's all too easy to miss this kind of mistake in the results because for complex systems, the results can be quite opaque. Approval testing for new code is still useful, but it makes me just a little bit nervous because it's self-referential. The code is correct because an earlier version of the code says it's correct. That's not a very strong assertion for correctness. It's a strong assertion of consistency, which is not really the same thing at all, but extremely useful nonetheless. So I use approval testing almost exclusively to support refactoring in legacy systems. If you'd like to see more of my recommended approach to refactoring in legacy systems, check out this free tutorial on refactoring, including the use of approval testing. There's a link in the description below. The other place where approval tests can be extremely useful though, is in comparing complex outputs. You have to be careful about not falling into the self-referential trap, but if you can confirm the correctness of the reference result carefully, approval tests can be extremely useful even uh, beyond their use in refactoring. For example, one kind of complex output that you can use them for is to test graphical outputs. Automated testing of graphical output is difficult, but with an approval testing approach, we can take a picture of the output and store it, and then compare it with subsequent runs of the code. If the comparison fails, the approval test infrastructure can show a side-by-side -side comparison of the images and ask a human to decide which one's correct, the new one or the old one. If it's the new one, that's correct, the new image is swapped to become the new reference result and the test passes. My friend Goiko Adzik has an open source project specifically designed for this kind of approval testing in graphical systems called Appraise. Another friend, Emily Baish, an expert in the use of approval testing, has described using this technique for comparing other forms of complex output, like 3D molecular models and blood test results. Approval testing is not a replacement for behavioral testing of BDD and TDD, in my opinion. And for the reasons that I've mentioned, I think it can be risky to rely on it too heavily for those things but it can play an extremely valuable role in de the deployment pipeline for those complex to interpret results sometimes. For me, the principal value though is in refactoring legacy code bases. For that, it's completely changed my approach. Thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoy our stuff on the Continuous Delivery channel, please do consider supporting our work by joining our Patreon community. There's some great conversations going on in di the Discord server. Thank you.